So I, I showed that video primarily for the wine at the end. How excited is everyone about drinking after this whole thing is wrapped up? Yeah? OK. This presentation is about emulating the world's fastest learners and trying to decipher the recipe, if there is one, that they share in common. And in fact, at least from what I've seen, it is possible by emulating these people to become world class in almost any skill. And by world class, I mean top 5% in the general population in 6 to 12 months. And that sounds ridiculous. But even recently, uh, yesterday, made an announcement uh, that in partnership with a company called Memorize, which is based out of the UK, built software for teaching people how to memorize a shuffled deck of cards. And for context, the US record up until very recently, and we're not as dumb as we look, was roughly one minute and 40 seconds. And in five days, had a 24-year-old out of the Ukraine learn how to do it uh, in less than 60 seconds. So it's, it is possible to do some pretty impressive things by embracing what I call, in this case, the four-hour ethos. And this is an optimal minimalism. Okay? This photograph, or pair of photographs that you see here, is actually of a linear restaurant, which when I wrote The 4-Hour Chef was the number one ranked restaurant in the United States. We'll come back to why that is relevant. But in the meantime, as we go through this, what I'd like everyone to do is hold in mind one skill that you would like to acquire or that perhaps you've given up on, whether that's learning to play the guitar, learning to speak another language like Spanish, could be anything. The guiding tenet for all of this is questioning the obvious. Question best practices. What if I did the opposite? Here's a quote, one of my favorites from Mark Twain. Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. And we'll do that several times throughout this presentation. You can also apply this thinking to business, just for those of you who may be wondering, how can I apply this to my professional life? These are just a few startups that I advise or have invested in among 30 or so. The first, Evernote. How do we put all of our money, what if we took all of our money and put it into product development as opposed to marketing and PR? Could we give away something for free that's good enough for 99% of our users? And the answer is, of course, yes. Uber, instead of creating something from whole cloth, how can we capitalize on excess capacity? Much like TaskRabbit, another company that I use. What if, what if, what if? Duolingo, some of you may know CAPTCHA and ReCAPTCHA, those forms you have to fill out that prove you're not a robot. The inventor of that, uh, Luis Van Aan, started Duolingo, which does two things simultaneously. It teaches you how to learn a foreign language for free, and then translates the web for everyone else to read in other languages. Automatic, last but not least, they're the people behind WordPress.com. They power about 17% of the internet, if you include the, the .org side of things. What if your entire company were virtual, and instead of that being a weakness, you were able to use that as a selling point? So you could actually spend that money on other things to recruit the best talent. So this applies far beyond the classroom. My interest in performance enhancement started at the biochemical level. This is vasopressin, or its synthetic version, desmopressin, which you saw in the video that I was snorting through my nostril. And uh, it is prescribed for bedwetting children past a certain age. That's not why I personally used it. But I used it based on my research into time travel. I bet you weren't expecting time travel. Some of you may experience this this evening, where you have one too many drinks, and you're here, and then all of a sudden, you're at 7-Eleven, then all of a sudden, you're staring at yourself in your mirror, and you don't remember 90% of what happened. That's because alcohol inhibits vasopressin. It's also why you pee so much if you drink a lot of alcohol. And my hypothesis was, that if I took one or two shots of this in each nostril, I should be able to, on the opposite end, improve short-term memory, which I was able to do. So I would take one or two shots before taking uh, Chinese character quizzes, flip through the pages almost as quickly as I could turn them, and score 90 to 100%. As you might imagine, this isn't the best long-term strategy. And so at that point, this was my sophomore year in college, I began to look for anomalies in the world of learning that I might emulate to find a method. And the first step, is being very, very confident. And you have to have some optimism that you can actually achieve what you might perceive goes beyond your limitations, uh, in this particular case in the world of athletic performance. Turns out, however, that genetics, even, are oftentimes negotiable. You need to establish a baseline and to take a realistic inventory of what your strengths and weaknesses are. This is in the Sports Science Institute of South Africa. That is my right leg. I'm filming this on a flip cam, back when they were relevant. And 
Uh, it's anesthetized. Uh, I encourage you to look away if you're easily nauseated. But I'd been told effectively by 23andMe and Navigenics that I lacked the ability to produce fast twitch muscle fiber, which I would need for any type of power training. Sorry, you lost the genetic lottery. You cannot, you, because of a nonsense allele with actin-3, become very good at power sports. I decided to actually test this and have tissue removed from my leg uh, to go past the theorizing. You don't have to do this. This is just an example of how far I've taken this, being a human guinea pig over the last few years. Uh, this is a muscle biopsy, and the way it's done is they take a hollow tube, insert it into your leg, apply a vacuum, and then twist off the muscle tissue inside. Doesn't actually hurt, because you don't have pain receptors on the inside of your leg, thankfully. You do feel it the next day, though. It doesn't feel very good the next day at all. What you hear, of course, is not Dutch. For those of you who aren't Dutch, that's Afrikaans. <sighs> I don't know why I just... <laughs> All right, so <laughs> it's Tim Tartar, as I started calling it. And the upshot of it was, turns out, because of my training, I had roughly 40 to between 60, uh, 40 and 60 percent fast twitch muscle fiber, all trainable. Okay. So let's go to the next. This is very different from the bodybuilder you saw, who, based on attributes, things you cannot copy. Was, was big and large. He also had some, some chemical enhancement, I'm sure. In this case, this is a normal-looking high school girl. Very normal-looking. Not normal in performance. Uh, this was sent to me by Coach Barry Ross in Los Angeles. Uh, she weighs about 130 pounds, so let's just call that 50, 55 kilos, and can deadlift, meaning pull 400-plus pounds, so let's just call that 200 kilos, off the ground for repetitions. And she's not a mutant. She's not a freak of nature. Barry Ross is able to take almost all of his athletes to that point. Realizing this, I felt very emasculated, of course. And once I got over that, decided to try to examine the technique. Is this something that I could apply to myself? And it was. I took the exact same method, which was questioning the obvious. Rather than pulling from here to here, which a lot of trainers recommend, it's the strongest range of motion, they would pull from the ground only about four or five inches up and then drop the weight. And I added. Uh, more than 50 kilos to my maximum deadlift in less than three months. Back to cooking. You wouldn't think that would have anything in common with cooking, but it does. So this is a table at a linear restaurant, and Chef Grant Ackett's, along with his co-founder, Nick Kakonis, question everything. They question everything in their restaurant. Instead of getting the menus at the beginning, you get the menus at the end. Instead of limiting themselves to plates, they designed their own custom serviceware. They wanted to make a four-foot-wide plate. Problem was, it wouldn't, couldn't get in and out of the kitchen. So they instead found hypoallergenic uh, latex, originally, I believe, from a sex shop in Paris, imported it and turned the table into the plate, as you see here. They also applied that to business. So after Alinea, they, they actually found a restaurant called Next. And if you look at the primary costs or losses in a restaurant, a few of them are four tops, i.e. four seaters that only have three people at them, and then no-shows, people who reserve and don't show up. So they decided to sell all of their seats as tickets, almost like, the, like, a, like season tickets to the opera or to sports games, and they sold them online. Guess how long it took to sell out their entire season for next? Not one week, not one day, not one hour, 10 seconds. They sold out their entire inventory for the entire season in 10 seconds. Again, this applies to everything. This is a type of thinking. And when you learn to cr think creatively about one thing, uh, this is actually something that happened during my meal at Alinea, you start thinking creatively about everything else. I had weeks of design deadlock for the cover of my book. And after one, one very peculiar dish at Alinea, was able to sketch this out. I had my breakthrough, and it became the cover. So this type of, this type of thinking, uh, questioning the obvious, transfers everywhere else. The method that I have arrived at after 15, 20 years of testing, looking for a method, a framework that could be applied to everything from language learning to sports, is this up here, DIS. And it's an acronym, with the exception of I, and we'll go through each in turn. The first step is deconstruction. Deconstruction means taking something very, very large and breaking it down into smaller pieces. It also means 
identifying why you might fail before you start. What are the reasons that you've quit? What are the reasons other people have failed? And the goal, we'll look at swimming, the goal is to avoid those problems for at least the first five sessions. That's it. And this is based on Nike Plus data. Once you log your data, or just practice in this case, for five sessions, they can be very short, you can establish that as a habit. That's your goal. Avoid these failure points for the first five sessions. So for swimming, in my case, I didn't learn to swim until a few years ago, which is very embarrassing for someone who grew up on Long Island with a rat tail. It was always due to difficulty breathing and exhaustion from kicking. All of the lessons I tried focused on those things, and I failed. So I found a method, which is called total immersion swimming, that completely avoids it. And you practice by practicing in shallow water and then kicking off from the wall. You don't have to worry about breathing. You don't have to worry about kicking. It looks like this. Streamline left to streamline right and repeat. Almost no kicking involved. Now we can go swimming for an hour in the ocean to relax. It's crazy. You can apply this everywhere. In cooking, for instance, it could be too much gear, too much expense, too much time. And it's also a matter of realizing that cooking, as we think of it, is not just one skill. For most people, it's shopping, prep, cooking, cleanup. So you need to take those away so you're only focusing on the cooking in the beginning. The next is selection. And selection is, in effect, the 80-20 principle, or Pareto's law, where you're trying to identify the 20% or fewer of activities, tools, et cetera, that produce 80% or more of the results. And you can, you can determine this pretty easily. There's a lot of research looking at different fields searching for exactly this. The Axis of Awesome, some of you may know, the awesomest band in Australia, perhaps. If you've ever wanted to learn to play the guitar, as I had for a very, very long time, found it intimidating for whatever number of reasons, the Axis of Awesome has a video online you can find on YouTube very easily where they use four or five chords to play almost every pop song you've ever heard. All of the most popular pop songs you can imagine, and they play them with four or five chords. That is an example of minimalism. Another example of minimalism would be language learning. So to become really functionally fluent in almost any language, you really only need 1,200 to 2,000 words to express any concept and to understand most concepts communicated to you. This is Cardinal Mezzofanti, Giuseppe Mezzofanti, born 1774. And he he was an incredible guy, uh, one of the most famous polyglots in the world. He'd been tested in 29 languages, fluent in 29, and was purported to speak as many as 72. How did he do it? You can't exactly go to Amazon.com in 1774 and buy materials. He did it by using the Lord's Prayer. He had the Lord's Prayer, and that to him in one page encapsulated all the fundamental grammar in any language, and he would have native speakers simply translate that for him. And I took a very similar approach with languages in these 12 or 13 sentences. I've applied this to Spanish, to German, to Gaelic, and I don't necessarily recall and retain all these languages, but I have done it with four or five that I've wanted to pursue to fluency. This encapsulates all the most important grammar. Is it subject, object, verb, subject, verb, object, indirect object, treatments, and so on. And you can, uh, you can completely deconstruct and, uh, and select, in effect, the grammar of a given language in, let's say, one to two hours. Here, these are from, from, from flights with Arabic and Russian, including the Cyrillic alphabet. It's very straightforward. Keeping in mind, also, that I had actually failed, effectively, Spanish when I had to take it in junior high and high school. I'd concluded that I was bad at languages. I wasn't bad at languages. I just had a bad method. So the minimalism, the 80-20 approach, can be applied to gear as well. Uh, as it applies to cooking, and I chose cooking, by the way, to explore accelerated learning in The 4-Hour Chef because it had beaten me many times before. It's something I had quit many times. So I wanted to take that on as a challenge. You don't need an entire set of 12, 15 pots or pans to cook effectively. And in fact, when I was uh, doing research for this book, which took me from Tokyo to Silicon Valley to India and elsewhere, in the, in the best Thai restaurant in India, the executive chef uses two stainless steel skillets and a chef's knife, a Victorinox chef's knife that you could buy at Walmart for $20. That's it. You don't need a lot. Cast iron skillet, basic knife, you're set. In terms of coffee, just for those people who might like coffee, uh, you see a number of tools here that I've used. I recommend the AeroPress, 
And all you need to remember is that, that you're grinding each serving, not grinding in advance, and then using water that is 180 degrees Fahrenheit or less. So that's about 82 degrees Celsius, I believe. Someone else can check that, I'm sure. And you won't ever have bitter coffee again. The next is sequencing. This is the secret sauce in a lot of ways. And the question you ask here is, what if I did things in the opposite order? What if I omitted what people tell me are best practices? And this has been applied elsewhere in manufacturing, for instance, with lean manufacturing with Toyota. This is Josh Waitzkin, one of my favorite people. Uh, Josh, if you've ever seen the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer or read the book, is the chess prodigy from that book. He's the little kid. Turns out that he has a framework. It's not that he has the inherent skills, although he's a smart guy. He has a framework that he can apply to many, many skills. And he's since, from being one of the world's best chess players, applied it to Tai Chi push hands to become national and world champion. He's applied it to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to become the first black belt under Marcelo Garcia, who's like the Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods combined in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. In the case of chess, what he did is he learned how to do it completely backwards. His first coach took him and said, rather than starting with openings that are very seductive and will lead you to memorize things, much like stealing the answers from the teacher for a math test, we're going to start with board control, which means you're going to have pawn and a king versus another pawn. And that's how we're going to play. So doing things in reverse actually can be extremely beneficial. When I was training for Argentine tango in Argentina, this was in 2005, uh, very accidental, in fact. But I looked at a number of ways that the best people competed, what they trained, uh, what they taught explicitly versus doing in competition but not teaching. And I decided that I thought I could make more progress by learning the female role first. So instead of learning the male role first, which is a real hassle, a real pain in the ass, and very embarrassing, I decided to learn how to follow. And I trained with one of the best female dancers uh, in the world uh, to learn how to follow. And five and a half months later, as part of that, uh, was able to go to the world championships and make it to the semifinals. I'm not a tango dancer. I'm built like a monkey. Look at me. So if I can do it, I think you guys could probably do very much the same. These next two photographs are related to learning skills under pressure or not learning them under pressure. The worst time to learn how to cook or, for instance, knife skills is when you're under pressure to make a meal. It's the worst time to do it. Uh, you should actually uh, look for opportunities to practice what I call no-stakes practice. So if you look at this second photograph here, I'm learning how to saute, which means to jump in French. And I'm not doing it over the stove. I'm actually practicing the wrist motion with dry beans in a skillet. And I'm kneeling on a carpet so they don't fly everywhere on a hardwood floor. You do this for 20 minutes, Two or three times, you'll have the motion down. And then you can use two hands over the stove and you won't have any problem. No omelets on the walls. All right. The last photograph, knife skills. This is something that's very intimidating for people. And it need not be intimidating. You just need to learn when you can't cut yourself. So this is a lettuce knife. The green knife is a lettuce knife. has the same form factor as the chef's knife next to it. So all you have to do is learn how to hold the knife properly, which you see here and then practice while you're watching Game of Thrones or whatever the hell you might be watching on TV <laughs> and just cut celery. Just get used to cutting celery. Again, do that for 20 minutes, two or three times, you'll be comfortable with a knife. And then you can use the stuff that can stab people. But start with the no stakes approach. Speaking of steaks, this doesn't mean steak, i.e. piece of cow. It means steak, like vampire, steak through the heart steak, or consequences. If you don't stick to your diet, what happens? You just stay the way that you've been. You don't get fired from your diet. You don't have someone chastise you necessarily about it. Of course, in your job, you do get fired if you don't do something. And you, therefore, are inclined to do it. You have an incentive. Uh, it is extremely, extremely effective to build incentives into whatever behavioral change you want in your life, to whatever skills you want to acquire. This is AJ Jacobs. AJ Jacobs is a human guinea pig, much like me. And uh, in this particular photo, or set of photographs, uh, he decided for a year to try to follow all of the rules in the Old and New Testament, which is extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. He lives in New York City. So the after photo that you see with, with the beard there is when he was dressed in full white robes and had his beard grown out. And he did everything. In fact, uh, when he had to stone adulterers, 
plays a pretty big part in the Bible. He was, uh, he was at a bit of a quandary because he didn't want to get arrested or just feel guilty or just kill anyone by stoning them. And he realized they didn't specify the size of the stones. So he got a pocket full of pebbles, little tiny pebbles, and he went to Central Park asking people if they were adulterers, and then he would you know, flick one at them and run away. <laughs> so, check. And uh, AJ, following this, this is a great book called The Year, the Year of Living Biblically. It's a wonderful book. Uh, decided he wanted to get in shape. And he had never been in shape. He had what he described as a, a python that swallowed a goat physique, which he was not happy with. And he didn't need a new special trainer. He didn't need a secret technique from the so former Soviet Union. He needed motivation. So AJ is Jewish, and he wrote a check to the KKK for $1,000 and gave it to one of his friends and said, if I don't lose X number of pounds, 30 pounds, by Y point in time, I want you to mail this to the KKK. That's an incentive. <laughs> Money is a great incentive, as all of you know. And you don't have to do what he did. Uh, you can use a tool like stick.com. I have no affiliation with them, I'm just a fan. Uh, stick.com came out of research done by a professor at Yale. It was initially called the Commitment Store. What do you do? You set your goal. I want to follow ABC diet. Next, you set your stakes. So I'm going to take 1% of my pre-tax income and put it into escrow as my stakes, my motivation. All right. Then, what's not in this, uh, in this list right here is you choose an anti-charity. So you choose a charity that you would rather nuke than give money to, that you would hate to have your name on the record for giving money to. Uh, the most popular, and this is not a political statement, just following the data, is the uh, George W. Bush Congressional Library. <laughs> that is the most popular anti-charity at the moment. So choose whatever you like. Then you find a referee. This could be a merciless friend who is willing to punish you if you don't do what you say you're going to do. Uh, or it could be someone from the site and then you have support, and on you go. And I've seen the data from this site. When you take someone and apply stakes and a referee, their compliance goes from something like 25 up to well over 70%. It, is, it has a huge impact, so consequences. What's the, the overlying principle for all of this? It's simplify. It is to keep things simple, and when you're looking for solutions, to try to remove things first rather than to add things. This is a really, really critical principle. And less can be, no, can be more in this particular respect, especially for behavioral change. This is a sign that I have over one of my doorways in my house, Simplify. And above that, I have a knife. Why knife? Because when you make a decision, the word decision is related to incision, it means to cut off. It means to cut away other options and to commit and to focus. And that's what I recommend all of you do with whatever that skill is that you have in your head still, hopefully. This is a beautiful example, an elegant example of simplification to me. Uh, this is one of the most delicious scones, you might think of it as a scone, or ash cake in this particular case, that was made for me. And it was made for me by Cliff Hodges, who is a former MIT engineer, runs a company called Adventure Out. And this was made in the Santa Cruz Mountains by simply taking acorn meal, which used to provide 75% of the calories for native Californians, and laying it directly on top of the embers of a fire. And it came out, it was absolutely incredible. And I think that that's what your results can be as well if you focus on removal. So I would encourage you in closing to hold in mind a quote from the author of The Little Prince. I love The Little Prince. What a lot of people don't realize is the author was also a pioneer in international flight and postal delivery. Very, very smart guy. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. That's my horrible French for you. But in English, what he said was, Perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing more to take away. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.